Well, I'm going to read this morning here from Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. So if you'll turn to verse 11, that's where I'm going to start to read down through verse 19. Ezekiel writes this, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Let's pause and pray there. Father, thank you for your word and for this time to gather here in your house. I'm grateful, Lord, for for you visiting us where two or more are gathered in your name. There you are in our midst, your word tells us. So we delight, Lord, in being in your midst, and we pray that everything that you see and hear would be glorifying to you, and it would be edifying, strengthening to our hearts. We give it to you now. We are thankful in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Listen to this quote. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Well, those were the words of an ancient Chinese general, philosopher, and military strategist from around the sixth century by the name of Sun Tzu. Uh, He was born in the mid sixth century, actually about 25 years after Ezekiel, the prophet here, died. And He is credited, Sun Tzu is credited with writing an ancient text called The Art of War, which has greatly influenced Eastern and Western military thinking and is still regarded today as the most influential strategy text in East Asian warfare. Now, I don't typically open up a Bible study quoting ancient Chinese texts. And for those of you who are new, you're like, what What does this guy get a sermon from a fortune cookie? No, (laughs) not typically, only sometimes, not, no, not ever. Um, But the reason I quoted this is because I thought what he had to say was actually pretty intriguing and important for us to hear. I'm gonna just read the last part of that quote one more time. Here's what he said. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Christians are in a battle. And we have to know both who we are, or probably better said, whose we are, and we have to know who the enemy is, or we will succumb in every battle. Here in Ezekiel chapter 28, God speaks to us through the pen of Ezekiel, and he gives us a description of our enemy. Satan. Now, at first glance, it may not look like he's talking about Satan in this text because this section is addressed as a lament for the king of Tyre, 
In fact, in my Bible, the subtitle above verse 11 simply says, Lamentation for the King of Tyre. But as you carefully examine the text, what you'll notice is that the King of Tyre, between verses 11 and 19, simply serves to be a picture, a type of our enemy, Satan. Let let me explain it to you uh, in a moment, but first, Let me give you the background of this chapter by asking you to go backwards to chapter 25. If you go back in your Bibles to chapter 25, um, there's a shift that happens in the book of Ezekiel at chapter 25. Uh, For those of you new to our study in the book of Ezekiel, um, this is the time period in which God has disciplined the Jewish people because they have refused to turn to God uh, despite the warnings of the prophets. They had engaged in idolatry and all kinds of immorality, and they did not turn uh, to the Lord. And so the Lord allowed the Babylonian Empire to come and besiege the southern part of the the nation of Israel, known as Judah, and, and to destroy Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah, because of their stubborn refusal, the Jewish people's stubborn refusal to turn to God and renounce their sin. 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon comes, takes tens of thousands of Jewish people back to Babylon, which is modern Iraq, along the Euphrates River, where they will be exiled for 70 years. It's all God's way of purging them from idolatry, giving them a wake-up call. You know how God sometimes does that with you and me, right? He allows us to uh, have certain difficulties in our lives to get our attention. And this is what he's doing with the Jewish people. Ezekiel is a Jewish prophet living among the exiles in Babylon. Jeremiah is a Jewish prophet living uh, still among the remnant in, in Jerusalem. And the Lord continues to show Ezekiel different things related to the circumstances of the people there in Babylon and related to some of the things happening back home. And one of the things happening back home that God takes issue with is, is the neighboring nations around Judah who are mocking the people of Judah and the God of Judah, meaning the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, they're mocking and they're rejoicing, they're celebrating in the misfortune of the Jewish people. And God doesn't like that. By the way, God never likes when we rejoice over the misfortune of others. I don't care how much you think they, quote, had it coming to them, okay? I know in our flesh we think, well, they they deserve that. They had it coming to them. God never likes us to rejoice over the misfortune of other people. And such was the case here. So in chapter 25, there's a little bit of a departure from the destruction of Jerusalem and God's discipline of the Jewish people. And he turns to the neighboring nations. And through Ezekiel the prophet, he says, I want you to give a warning of judgment. I want you to give an indictment and statements of judgment about the neighboring nations who who are these pagan nations who have been rejoicing over the misfortune of the Jewish people. And he starts in chapter 25 with Ammon. If you notice different subtitles in your Bible through chapter 25, he he addresses Ammon first, which is basically the equivalent of Ammon, Jordan. So that's that's the location of Ammon. They've been rejoicing over Judah's misfortune. Next uh, territory he rebukes is Moab, there in chapter 25. Uh, Moab is east of the Dead Sea in what is today Jordan. They were also guilty of mocking Judah. He moves on and he rebukes Edom. Edom is south of the Dead Sea, overlapping kind of southern Israel and western Jordan, kind of where Saudi Arabia meets, all in that area. Uh, And then he also rebukes uh, Philistia. Philistia was along the Mediterranean coast, a small strip of land uh, where where the Philistines lived. Today, it is referred to as the Gaza Strip. And so they are also rebuked for their uh, vengeance that they want against Judah, their longstanding hostility. And then God devotes almost three entire chapters. You'll notice in your Bibles, chapter 26, 27, and 28, he, he devotes almost three entire chapters to a rebuke of Tyre. Now, Tyre was a seaport city along the Mediterranean coast in what is today Lebanon. Uh, Tyre is located about 50 miles due south of Beirut. And Tyre served to be the principal city, the capital city of the Phoenician kingdom. And during their heyday, which is this time in which Ezekiel is writing, the Phoenicians controlled all of the um, uh, naval commerce uh, among the whole Mediterranean world. 
because of their strategic location there at Tyre. And the king of Tyre became wealthy over all of the shipping industry and commerce from the sea, controlling all of that uh, navigation. And, and so the king of Tyre became proud and he became boastful, he became arrogant. He, he delighted in his riches and in his position and in his power. And so he gets rebuked here. Now, now, they are also guilty of rejoicing in the misfortune of the people of Judah, but God's got some specific things to say about the king of Tyre. And what's interesting is, in chapter 28, you can go back to chapter 28, the first part of chapter 28, he's dealing with the literal king of Tyre. And then he shifts to the verses that I read at the top of our Bible study, and he talks about a figurative king Tyre who serves to be a picture of or a type of Satan. Now, let me point this out to you. If you go back here to chapter 28, I'm going to read the first five verses. And the first five verses, Ezekiel is addressing the literal King Tyre. And here's what we read. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, that's pride, and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a god, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. I think there's some sarcasm there. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Now, pause there for a moment, and so you, get, you get the idea of the king of Tyre. Uh, the king of Tyre, this is a literal rebuke of the literal king of Tyre, first five verses here. He's proud, he's boastful, he's arrogant. His power, position, and prestige and privilege have all gone to his head such that he has now deified himself in his own mind. And the king of Tyre sees himself like a god. I'm ruling the seas, I'm controlling all the shipping commerce, I'm, I'm wealthy, I'm powerful. And so God rebukes him for this. But because he is like this, boastful, proud, arrogant, all of this, he serves to be a perfect picture, a type of Satan. Because Satan, likewise, became proud on account of his beauty. He was boastful. He was arrogant because of his power and privilege and prestige. It all went to his head. Satan deified himself in his mind, and he became like God, wanting to be God, you see. And so there's a shift here in chapter 28 where verses 11 to 19 that I started our Bible study with are now the figurative King Tyre. Not the literal King Tyre. It's now shifting here to use the kind of man that, that the King of Tyre was as a picture to, to help us understand a little bit about our enemy, Satan. So let me point this out to you. There, there, there are several reasons why in verses 11 and 19, it's not the literal king Tyre. I'm going to point out a few to help us see that God is actually using the king to paint a picture of who our real enemy is, which is Satan. So if you'll notice in your Bibles there in chapter 28, verse 13, it tells us that he was in Eden, the garden of God. He was in Eden, the garden of God. You see that? Well, there were only four beings in Eden outside of the animal kingdom. And that was Adam, Eve, God, and Satan. And then Eden ended up, you know, being guarded for a while after Adam and Eve were expelled, and then it was destroyed by the flood. The king of Tyre was never in Eden, the garden of God. So again, this is helping us to understand, oh, this is just, that's figurative. This is actually speaking here about Satan. If you notice also in verse 13, the latter part of verse 13, it talks about how he was created. That's an important word, created. The Hebrew word is bara. Bara is a word that means to create something out of nothing. Uh, much of the Genesis account uses the word bara in terms of creation. Uh, but typically, that's not going to describe a human being because uh, subsequent to the first Adam who was created, uh, we've been made. Uh, we, we've been made out of material that exists, being, you know, a, a descendant race of people. In fact, remember in Psalm 139, verse 14, when, when David was ascribing honor to God about life, he said, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't say I was fearfully and wonderfully created. And it's a different Hebrew word because 
human beings, generally speaking, are made, the original Adam created, and so this speaks here not of the king of Tyre when God uses the word created, this also speaks of the creation aspect of the angelic beings. This is a reference again to Satan. Also in your Bibles there, verse 14, God just clearly calls him the anointed cherub. In verse 14, the anointed cherub. The NIV says the guardian cherub. This is a being, a cherub is a being of the angelic order. Now, Ezekiel has more to say about cherub, or cherubim is the plural. Ezekiel has more to say about cherubim than any other book of the Bible. There's a fascinating study when you read through the book of Ezekiel, and just especially like chapter 10 talks extensively about cherubim, uh, and here's this other reference to an anointed cherub. So Ezekiel knows a lot about um, these angelic creatures. Uh, they are not, contrary to your Christmas cards, they are not chubby little babies with little wings floating on wispy clouds. That is not a cherub. Cherub are of the high angelic order. They were winged creatures, the Bible does say, and they were always in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says that God is enthroned between the cherubim. In fact, as part of God's um, detailed description of how the temple should be built and adorned, cherubim were to be and were in Solomon's temple uh, carved on, on the interior of the temple of the Lord and uh, cherubim were fashioned out of gold with their wings extended and placed over top of the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat of God. So cherubim are, are referenced throughout the Bible and the fact that God is referring here to you being the anoint, an anointed cherub is not a reference to the king of Tyre. He's not an angel. He's not, he's not of the angelic order. Satan is, however, because Satan was originally created as an anointed cherub, as a guardian cherub. And then also one more point I'll mention. There's several things here, but just one more point. Verse 16, the latter part of verse 16, God says, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God because he had sinned. So he says, I cast, you out of the, out, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. This is a reference to when Satan was cast out of heaven because of his pride and rebellion and his sin. The king of Tyre was never cast out of the mountain of God. So again, when you're reading these verses here in Ezekiel 28, 11 and 19, these, this all speaks of our enemy. And we, we got to know our enemy and we have to know who we are or who's we are lest we succumb in the battle. You see, Satan started out as a beautiful angelic creature is what this text is telling us. His, his being was adorned with every precious gem and stone. That list that we read uh, through earlier, uh, I mean, it speaks of some incredible gems that adorned the very being of Satan when he was first created in verse 13, sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. I mean, just try to imagine a very spectacular, colorful being. And it also tells us, by the way, in verse 13 of our text, that he was also created with timbrels and pipes. Now, it's very interesting. There's been a lot of discussion and debate about what those words mean. But when, when you dig it out a little bit, it's, it seems to be from many Bible scholars that timbrels refers to something like a drum or a tambourine and pipes refers to something like a flute. And that what is being suggested in the text is that the very being of Satan in his original design were embedded within his being musical instruments. That actual musical instruments were part of his being. You know, for those of you musicians, you, you, gotta, you gotta haul your musical instrument everywhere you go, all right? Not Satan. He would just be like, you know, playing the flute off of, off of something, some appendage of his or whatever. But uh, a lot of Bible scholars believe that Satan was actually the original worship leader in heaven. Does, that, that's no reference of our worship leaders. I'm just pointing it out, okay? <laughs> It's just like, you know, we have wonderful people who work in our finance department. Okay, Judas, okay, you know, but, it, but, but don't blame them, you know. So anyway, I'm just pointing it out. So here he is, this beautiful angelic creature uh, adorned with all these precious gems and stones, musical instrumentation embedded in his body, 
And it was on account of his beauty, verse 17 tells us, that pride filled his heart. And he sinned against God. And he led a rebellion in heaven. And Revelation 12 tells us that he swept a third of the stars, meaning angels, with him in that rebellion. And so God kicked him out of heaven along with a third of the angels who rebelled with him who are now more commonly known as demons, those fallen angels. And Satan and his demons were cast to earth. Revelation 12 verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Jesus was there to see all this, by the way. He said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And so Satan is cast down to earth, and he first appears in the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent. And he's there to deceive Eve and Adam into following his rebellion. And he's been leading the whole world astray ever since, influencing the world with his evil. This is what he's up to. Revelation 20 speaks of Satan's ultimate judgment when God will cast him into the lake of fire where he will be tormented forever. Revelation 20.10 says, The devil who deceived the world was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But his judgment is future. So presently, meanwhile, we have an adversary who is unseen, who along with his demonic forces are working to wreck this world working to wreck your life, your marriage, your family, anything he can to influence you away from God. He is crafty. He is sly. He is subtle. And he is deceiving people into believing lies as if they were the truth. And the Bible tells us this. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age, small g, a reference to Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Our world is under a demonic delusion. The influence of Satan in our world is undeniable, except, of course, to people who are blinded like 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And then they don't see what we're talking about. There's some people who even think, I'm off my rocker for talking like this. Because they don't understand. They've been blinded to the reality that Satan, our adversary, is working in subtle, deceptive, lying ways to convince people of things that aren't true. Because his ultimate desire is to take as many people to hell with him. So he's working overtime. And it's undeniable in our culture. You can see the normalization and celebration of gender confusion and sexual sin, the adoration of creation over the Creator, the elevation of the spotted owl and sea turtles with more legal protection today than an unborn baby, and the murder of those unborn babies as reproductive rights, the rise in racism and anti-Semitism, hatred and hostility, pornography, and every evil under the sun, all of this and much more is incited by Satan, who wants no one to be saved, no one to be delivered, no one to be healed or made whole, who simply wants you to believe the lie that you are good and God is not, that you are your own savior and Jesus is not, that maybe there's a heaven, but there's certainly not a hell, so that you will die in your sins separated from God. This is your enemy. But Jesus comes along in John 10, verse 10, and he says, the thief, meaning Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's Jesus. That's our Savior. And we are called to take our stand against the devil and his schemes. So we have to know our enemy, and we have to know whose we are. I'm going to give you three quick points in five minutes that I have left. For you note-takers especially, you can write these things down. Our stand against Satan, three things that the Bible teaches us, other things, but I just wanted to kind of 
scale it down to three things that we could remember particularly. Number one is to resist him, to resist him. First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone, seeking those to devour. It says, resist him, standing firm in the faith. The Apostle James said something very similar to what Peter said. In James 4, 7, James wrote, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, a lot of times people think, I'm just going to resist the devil. No, you've got to submit to God first. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The idea of resisting the devil means to be wise about the ways of Satan, his strategies, his deception his temptations, his evil influence in our world and in our homes. And rather than being seduced by all that, to resist, to resist him, to give the enemy no ground in your life. Be wise about the way that he works, friends. We're on to you, devil. I have a friend who, I have a friend, this is, I think this is a common saying that some people like to, like to use, but but uh, there's this lady that I know, and, she, and every time she comes up to something that she knows, probably, probably Satan's behind this. She goes, not today, devil, not today. And you can just hear her walking around sometimes going, not today, devil, not today. And that's why we, we need to be wise about the way that he works and resist him and give the enemy no ground, either for ourselves or our loved ones. Number two, rely on the word of God and prayer as weapons of our warfare. There's a passage in the, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, a very familiar passage to many of you, where Paul likens the spiritual battle that we face. In fact, in Ephesians 6, Paul talks about the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They're unseen, but, but they are there looking to devour you. And he likens the spiritual battle that we're in to getting dressed for battle like a Roman soldier. And in Ephesians chapter six, he talks about the different aspects of the attire of a, a military soldier in the Roman army and how we have to be like this. It's very appropriate because we're in a battle. And, and at the end of, of the list, I just wanted to highlight from Ephesians six, verses 17 and 18, that Paul reminds us the greatest arsenal, uh, the, the greatest weapons that we have in our arsenal are the word of God and prayer. He ends the section on spiritual warfare saying this in Ephesians 6, 17 to 18. He says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. He says, we got to take the Word of God and we got to be praying people. We got to know Scripture as our defense, as our weapon of warfare. Actually, it's the only offensive weapon mentioned in the list of Ephesians chapter 6. It's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. We have to know Scripture. We have to know our Bibles to be able to quote Scripture at those times when we feel under attack from the enemy. Remember, every single time when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, every, sim sim every single time that Satan tempted him, Jesus responded with Scripture. And by the way, Satan also quoted Scripture in that passage, too, of, of the temptation of Christ. Uh, but because Satan knows Scripture, he just doesn't submit to it. But it was Jesus who quoted Scripture in response every single time. When you feel the enemy is trying to attack you, your marriage, your kids, whatever it is, hit him with the word. Hit him with the word. But you got to know the Bible in order, in order to be able to quote the Bible, to stand on Scripture, the word of God, as the weapon of your warfare, and pray. Pray. Pray for your loved ones and your friends that are under the delusion of the enemy, who are believing the lies of our culture, who are living lifestyles based on how our world now normalizes and celebrates certain lifestyles, they're living under the delusion, it's the lie of the enemy, pray for them. Love them, pray for them. Pray when you feel attacked. Pray when you 
think that others are being attacked. Pray without ceasing. And then finally, number three, is to remember that God's spirit in you is greater than Satan's power around you. First John 4, 4, famous verse, many of you know, greater is he that is in you, the Lord, than he that is in the world. We don't fight our battles in our own strength, friends. You know, in the book of Jude, it talks about how the archangel Michael dared not to dispute with Satan over the body of Moses. Okay, apparently Satan was, at, upon the death of Moses, wanting to do something to maim the body of Moses or to do something to the body of Moses. And it says that Michael the archangel dared not to dispute with Satan over the body of Moses, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Because greater is the Lord, greater is Jesus, greater is our Savior than the enemy of our souls. And so stand in the Lord and in his mighty power and remember that greater is the Lord in you than he that is in the world. Know your enemy and know whose you are so that you do not succumb in the battle. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can turn to you and look to you and live in your strength and in your power and in your grace. Shield us, we pray, from the enemy of our souls. I pray that we would be more aware of the tactics of the enemy. You tell us in your word in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. How many times have we argued with one another, flesh and blood, thinking that we were the problem or they were the problem, when all along, perhaps, sometimes, it's just the enemy stirring stuff up. Lord, there's probably a husband and a wife right now that they're here today, and I'm grateful for that, but they've been in an argument. And maybe, just maybe, it's all part of the tactic of the enemy to divide them. Maybe each other's not the problem that the other person thinks they are. Maybe, maybe it's the battle that we face in the heavenly realms. How the enemy loves to destroy marriages. How the enemy loves to steal kids. To rob them of their innocence. To deceive them with the lies of our culture bathe our children's minds and hearts in the truth of your word, Lord. And may we fight for our families in prayer. May we lift up our loved ones, our co-workers, our neighbors, people that we see who don't know you, living a lie, embracing lies. Not to be judgmental, but just to stand in the gap and pray for them, to love them to want them to be free and whole and forgiven. Oh Lord, how the enemy wants none to be saved, none to be delivered, none to be free. But if we know the truth, the truth will make us free. You came to give us life and life more abundantly while the enemy is trying to rip us off to steal, kill and destroy. Greater are you, Lord, in us than he that is in the world. Help us to stand strong in the faith, to resist the devil that he would flee, to remember that you are great and unmatched by any force of evil, Lord. And may we take out the weapons of our warfare, the word of God and prayer to come against the attacks of the enemy, that we might stand, Lord, in your grace and in your strength. We love you and we praise you. We give you thanks together in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.